America's number one national television program on Asia. Hello, I'm Yusai Khan. The traditional Chinese form of marriage was more of a contract between families rather than an affair of the heart. The bride and groom seldom saw or spoke to each other prior to their wedding, since marriages were usually arranged by a third party. And this, the traditional bridal chamber, is where the newlyweds actually got acquainted. Well, Chinese notions of romance and matrimony have come a long way since then. And today, both dating and mating can be glitzy, high-tech affairs that spell big business. As we shall see, as Looking East uncovers love and marriage, Taiwanese style. The teachings of Confucius have been the cornerstone of Chinese society for over 2,000 years. It was a philosophy that emphasized the importance of family, which was male-dominated, since male children would carry on the family name. A woman's role was one of obedience to her father before marriage, to her husband during marriage, and to her sons when widowed. And for centuries, the Chinese ideal was the extended family, the notion of having five generations under the same roof. In the Republic of China on Taiwan, people pride themselves on their Chinese cultural heritage, and many still pay lip service to the teachings of Confucius. In recent years, however, Taiwanese society has undergone vast changes, spurred on by rapid economic growth and modernization. One visible effect on, uh, on the family as a result of industrialization and urbanization is the geographic mobilities. In other words, the separation of family members from the younger generation and the older generations. In Taipei or in other metropolit metropolitan uh, cities, you will see a lot of migrants young couples moving in and live in the cities with their parents still live in the countryside. So the separation uh, is very clear. And also the, the increased numbers of uh, the small families. Modernization has altered not only the size of the family unit, but also the way these units are formed. In the cities, arranged marriages are a thing of the past. And even in the countryside, the introduction of prospective maids doesn't guarantee matrimony. Still, old traditions die hard. So in this electronic age, we have a phenomenon like Wo Ai Hong Niang, or I love the matchmaker. This top-rated weekly television show is a mixture of America's dating game and the love connection. Each week, two pairs of total strangers are matched. Today, the first match involves an eligible single and three contestants for his affections. To start off, the hosts introduce the young bachelor, listing his vital statistics including weight, height and occupation. He has to demonstrate his appeal, for example, by showing off his singing skills. Then, two character witnesses for the young man are brought on. In this case, they are his mother and his boss, who for some reason also gets to sing. The young man is then sent behind a heart-shaped screen dubbed the Door of Friendship. So to the contestants, he is a mysterious silhouette, the ultimate blind date. Now the three contestants are introduced, each being required to show off her special qualities. 
。哦，这是还牵了一条小狗，哎，好极了。The witnesses are also required to vouch for the character of the young man. 我想，如果今天我是 maybe twenty years old， 嗯哼，如果是你才二十岁的话 ，and if I had a chance like this， 你像他们一样有那么机会 ，I will like to be with him too. 哦，每个人可能都会喜欢他。After some question and answer sessions designed to find out more about the three young ladies, our prize bachelor confers with his so-called teammates about his imminent choice. And the winner is. The second half of the show involves a one-on-one -on -one match of a slightly older couple, usually in their thirties. This segment is called Big Brother, Big Sister, and is less competitive in nature. It's another blind date, this time the meeting of two people and their respective families and friends. The participants are usually well established in their careers, and they may have brothers and sisters who are already married with children, so their families want to have them married as soon as possible. In general, they are more nervous, and the families are a little more anxious. That's why we do the straightforward one-to-one -one approach. I Love the Matchmaker has been on the air in Taiwan since 1982. It's so popular that the show can be seen on some Chinese language channels overseas. It has also gone on location in Los Angeles and in San Francisco. As in Taiwan, all the participants are carefully screened before coming on the program. The 200th show was the occasion of a special which brought together a hundred couples who met and later married as a result of participation in I Love the Matchmaker. So far, we've matched 200 couples who actually got married. Of these 200 couples, we don't mean to say that the pairs we matched on the shows were the same ones who later married. Actually, what happens is that the show provides many follow-up activities for the participants. We have a kind of club called Friends of the Matchmaker. Participants on the show all become members of the club. So later, they become involved in the activities of the club, through which they meet the people they eventually marry. I also observed from the show's taping that the old stereotype of the Chinese woman as submissive wallflower simply doesn't apply anymore. When we first started the show, the concept was a little different. We figured that the ladies and gentlemen might be embarrassed to be on the program, since at the time we weren't as open-minded a people as we've become. So the show was devised in such a way that the participants would go on wearing face masks. But it was the female participants who said to us, well, since we don't get to see our prospective dates during most of the show anyway, why do you have to wear masks? Of course, we were glad to oblige. So even for the first show, the masks came off. The trend seems to be that the ladies aren't as shy as the men on the show. The ones who really open up and talk more freely about themselves are women more than men. We also get more female applicants to the show than males. Since attitudes towards dating, romance and marriage have changed in modern Taiwan, it comes as no surprise that the actual process of getting married has also taken some innovative turns in this enterprising society. One example of how to make marriage a trendy affair can be found at the Sesame Wedding Plaza, a combination of photo studio, beauty salon, boutique, and wedding services center a kind of matrimonial Disneyland.
The Sesame Plaza in Taipei, along with several branches in major Taiwanese cities, is the brainchild of T. H. Chen. Himself a photographer, Mr. Chen takes pride in the innovations he has made with his business. The wedding plaza came into being as a concept of convenience, because people in Taiwan these days are so pressed for time. In the past, you take photos during the wedding, when everything else is happening. We came up with the innovation of taking the pictures before the wedding, so there's more time. In the States, people do a lot of wedding photos outdoors. But in Taiwan, they still do it mainly indoors. So we shoot both indoor and outdoor. In the old days, it was just a matter of taking a keepsake photo, a very conservative concept. But later, people began to require that the picture take on symbolic meaning, or reflect their style or character, or they want to do it in a casual setting where they can be themselves, or even the place where they first met. These days, they want not just a picture, but a pin-up poster or a painting-sized portrait, and it has to be symbolic or relate to their professions. So the customers are demanding more and more, but for me, it's becoming more and more challenging. Thirty-year-old Chen Wei Xin and twenty-six-year-old Wang Yujun are getting married in just over two weeks. They have come to Sesame Wedding Plaza for its specialized services, which include all aspects of makeup and grooming, and all aspects of costuming. The wedding gowns and tuxedos here can be bought or rented. There is also a wide selection of jewelry, which may also be bought or rented. Sesame also provides transportation, desk decorating, and other wedding-related services. Today, Mr. Chen is personally supervising the photo session, and he is dishing out the full treatment. Starting with a standard studio setting, to something a little more outlandish. This is literally a boat dangling from the side of the building. Finally, a more traditional scene with bride and groom in Chinese wedding costumes. Mr. Chen gladly indulges his customers' notions of glamour and romance by providing generous doses of makeover and dress up. Which some may find a bit excessive. After all, these people are getting married, not auditioning for a Hollywood movie. Of course, it's commercialized, very commercialized event. Taking good pictures, I think uh, in a way, is people want to uh, use the modern way to show the traditional values, and that kind of arrangement is neat, clean, and nice. And young people like that. They want to keep that marriage as a precious、uh, event of their life. Each year, some three to five thousand couples pass through Sesame's doors. Some paying well over a thousand U.S. dollars for the star treatment. So business is good. And by realizing the dreams of his clients, Mr. Chen has realized his own boyhood dream of starting a successful enterprise called Sesame. He chose the name because he went to a primary school located next to a sesame oil factory, and the fragrant aroma of sesame became an everyday fact of life for him. But there is another reason for the name. When I was young, I used to draw cartoons like Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. That also had a strong influence on me. The idea of open sesame and all will be granted to you. It's a metaphor for marriage. The door of marriage opens. You go in and you find everything you've always wanted.